So I hope you're paying attention during Jonathan's talk, um, because I'm going to talk about some follow-up work that we've done to the original lottery ticket hypothesis, answering some of the questions that he kind of so elegantly foreshadowed, um, and talking about kind of how we might be able to take this initial observation that was present in these fairly limited tasks and limited contexts and generalize it to new, co new contexts um, and to really probe why these lottery tickets work and, you know, do they, are they doing something that is a fundamentally interesting or are they doing something that's a little more simple? Um, so uh, Jonathan just elegantly went through this whole thing, so I'm going to go through this very briefly. Um, but the lottery ticket hypothesis right, is trying to answer this question of why is it that we can train these big networks and we can prune them down and have minimal loss in accuracy? But we often can't train these small networks to begin with. And the answer is that if you have the right starting point, the right initialization, then it turns out that you can do this. Now, um, throughout this talk, I'm going to show a slightly different uh, visualization of the data. I'm going to show also a lot of data here, so just be prepared for that. Um, Jonathan was showing you kind of these training curves of when you have 100% of the network, what does it look like over the course of training? Where does it end up? What happens at 50%? We can re-represent this, and this is a plot, by the way, from Jonathan's paper, um, by plotting on the y-axis just the end of that training process. So what's the network's final accuracy at convergence? Um, so this is kind of the, at the end of training, what does the network do? As a function of how many of the weights we remove. So on the x-axis here, on the far left, would be the full network. That's before you do any sort of pruning. And then as you go across the x-axis um, to the right, we're going to make the network smaller and smaller and smaller. And then in this plot, he's showing in the dark red line is using the lottery ticket initialization, and the dashed red line is the random initialization, the reinitialization that he was talking about. Um, so you can see that the dark red line does a lot better. Um, and that gap between these two lines is what we would consider to be the lottery ticket effect. That if you use the right starting point, then you're going to get better performance at all these pruning rates. Okay, so there are a lot of open questions. Jonathan just mentioned a couple of them. One is, that's really important, is do these winning tickets actually contain generic inductive biases, or are they merely kind of initializations which are quote unquote closer to the final state? So you can imagine that I could initialize the network right next to where it's going to end up, and that would work really well, but the network wouldn't be learning very much. Um, so that would be kind of an example of what we call overfitting, or a network that's really just finely tuned to the particular problem setting that it's learned on. But it, what, so one of the big questions here is are, is, are these lottery tickets actually a little bit more generic than that, or are they just really overfit? Um, another important question is, is this a general phenomenon across deep learning, or is this kind of merely restricted to the context of supervised image classification? A lot of things that work in supervised image classification don't work once you get to RL or NLP or these different paradigms. And there's some other important ones, like how do various pruning methods impact these? So that would be like structured versus unstructured pruning. Um, and ultimately, what makes these special? Um, I'm not, we're doing some work on the latter two. I'm not going to talk about them today. Today, I'm going to focus on the top two questions. So first, um, the top question uh, is we're going to talk about generalizing these across different data sets. And this is evaluating the generality of a given winning ticket. Um, this is work that was done with a bunch of other people at FAIR, um, Haonan, Michaela, and Yandong. Um, OK, so are winning tickets overfit? For them to be useful practically, we really want them to contain generic inductive biases, meaning that they, can, they have some property about them which makes neural, network train, neural networks train better broadly, not just for the specific problem where we found them, right? If you imagine if they were really overfit, then every time I have a new problem, I'd have to find a new winning ticket. And as Jonathan described, this is really expensive. You have to train, prune, train, prune, train, prune. Um, and oftentimes can be you know, 20 or 30 times more expensive than training the, the, the network in the first place. Um, so it's important that they're actually generic in some ways. And that's the main question we're trying to ask here. Do they generalize? Um, and the basic paradigm here is we're going to generate a winning ticket in one paradigm or one context, so one data set, say. And then we're going to ask, if we use that winning ticket now in a different problem, in a different data set, will it work? And if it does work, then it suggests that there's something generic about the inductive bias conferred by this winning ticket. If it didn't work, then it would suggest that these winning tickets are really overfit to the particular problem in which they were found. So this is the main question. Um, some preliminaries, we did a lot of this on a bunch of different models. Um, the main one I'm going to show today is VGG19, which is kind of a slightly older model that's very popular, but we got kind of qualitatively similar results in ResNets. Um, they're in the paper and in the end of the slides, but for time. Um, and this is a bit of a technical point that I'm going to skip. 
Um, okay, so the first way we can kind of test this is actually saying, do winning tickets transfer or generalize within the same data distribution? So this is the same data set, but just different sets of examples, right? Um, and we're going to use CIFAR 10 throughout this paper, um, or throughout this study, which if you're not familiar, is a really simple kind of benchmark image classification data set with 10 classes. They're like dogs, cats, planes, things like that. Um, and they're 32 by 32 images. So they're really small. They don't look particularly nice to the human eye. Um, so first what we did is we just divided this data set into, in half. So we made what we call 10A and 10B. And we asked, if we find a winning ticket on 10A, will it work on 10B? Um, and that gives us a plot like this. So again, on the y-axis here, we're showing the performance at convergence of the networks trained on CIFAR 10B. And then there are a couple different lines here. First, focus on the red line. The red line is showing what happens when you have a random initialization. So this is if I were just to start from scratch, I was just going to prune the network randomly and then say, how does this work? The, yellow, the, the blue line is what if we found the winning ticket using CIFAR 10B and then tested it on CIFAR 10B. So this is exactly, the, yellow, the blue line, sorry, would be equivalent to what Jonathan did in his previous paper. And then the yellow line is asking, what if we found the ticket in the context of the first half of the data set, 10A, and then evaluated it now in this different data set, or the different part of the data set, 10B. And what you notice is first comparing um, blue to red, blue does much, much better than red, right? Especially at these very extreme pruning rates, you know, when you go to get to, at the very far right there, 99.9% .9 of the parameters are removed. So that network is, you know, a thousand times smaller. Um, and you can see that there's a huge gap between that. But what's encouraging here is that yellow and blue are very similar to one another. So suggests that if we find the winning ticket in one half of the data set, that'll also work on the other half. But this is really the most trivial case. What about if we actually try moving across different data sets altogether? Um, so here what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate now on the full CIFAR 10 data set. And we're going to source the winning tickets from a couple different other data sets. CIFAR 100 is very similar to CIFAR 10, except there are 100 categories instead of 10 categories. Um, ImageNet, which you may have heard of, is a very, very large data set. CIFAR 10 and 100 only have um, 50,000 training examples, maybe 60,000 if you include the validation set. Um, ImageNet has you know, at least 1.2 million examples. And the images are much larger. They're 224 by 224. Um, so ImageNet is kind of a, a, a much harder task um, than CIFARs. And CIFAR 100 also is harder than CIFAR 10. Um, and what you notice is, first off, just look at the blue line and compare it to the red line. That's comparing the CIFAR 10 winning ticket to this random again. The red line is always going to be random. Um, and we see a gap, which is good. But kind of very surprisingly and kind of cool is that if we look at the yellow and green lines, which are winning tickets that came from these different data sets, from CIFAR 100 and from ImageNet, they actually work really well on this problem. In fact, they sometimes work better than the actual CIFAR 10 uh, winning ticket, which we found on the same data set. And you can see that on the very right, it's still doing a little better. We see similar results on CIFAR 100. I'm going to skip this just for time. Um, and if we even go all the way up to ImageNet, we get this really cool pattern, um, which is that uh, the, we can find that while ImageNet tickets in green do really well, um, we, can take t we can take winning tickets from other data sets, like Places 365, which is another really large data set. Um, and that works pretty well. But note, it doesn't work quite as well as the image, the brown and the green lines aren't overlapping. There's a little bit of gap. And that suggests that some aspect of these winning tickets is a little bit overfit. Um, but if we go to like CIFAR 10 now, which is a really small data set, and now we try to move it to a really big data set, that's the blue line, it doesn't really work all that well. So a key lesson here, a takeaway is that the bigger the data set, the more general the winning ticket you find. I'm gonna skip this. Uh, and we see um, similar results on places. I mean, actually, in fact, in places, ImageNet tickets do just as well as the places tickets. Um, OK, uh, another question we can ask is, what about if you do different ways of learning? So an optimizer is a way that you learn. Um, I'm just going to show this for a second, but the bottom line is that it works really well. So we can generate the winning tickets using one optimizer, what's called S, kind of standard SGD with momentum, and then evaluate using a different optimizer, one called Atom. Um, and we find that it works really well, and we can also go the other way. Um, so main takeaways from this part, winning tickets do contain these generic inductive biases. Um, and this is really encouraging because it suggests that we might be able to find a winning ticket in one, prop, one context just once. Right? I can take, find in this big data set, and that's expensive, but I only have to do that once. And then you give me some random new problem, and I can just use that winning ticket I found 
um, previously, and it'll work on this new problem. Um, some caveats here, we only am analyze natural image data sets and image classification, um, and some other important caveats, but I just want to briefly touch on the next part um, before I run out of time. Um, so another important question here is, is, is the winning ticket phenomenon, is lottery ticket, just an artifact of supervised image classification, or does it say something more general about deep learning? So to evaluate that, we want to test this phenomenon in the context of two very different paradigms, natural language processing and um, reinforcement learning. Um, and that's basically what this slide says. Uh, so uh, what I'm showing here is a transformer, which is kind of the, one of these big models which has kind of revolutionized natural language processing recently. Um, this mo model has 63 million parameters, so it's really big. Um, and in blue, we're showing the winning tickets. It's the same sort of curve, so the performance of the model on a machine translation task. Um, so this is translating English to German. Um, in blue is the winning ticket, and in red is a random ticket. So kind of consistent with the results in supervised image classification, we find that this effect still is there. Um, and if we go to an even bigger transformer, um, which has 200 million, per, or 200 million parameters, um, we see that we do even better. In fact, we can remove two-thirds of the network and have basically no drop in accuracy whatsoever training this from scratch. So that's taking this 200 million, turning into a 60, 67 million parameter network or something, and that saves a lot of compute. So that's really useful. Um, finally, we can also look at this in the context of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is what's been used to do things like AlphaGo um, and to solve uh, Atari games. And we basically just evaluated this in the context of Atari games. Um, we looked at a bunch of different Atari games. I'm just showing a couple here. Um, and in most of them, we found that winning ticket effect to be really true. So again, compare the blue to the red. The blue is a winning ticket. Red is a random ticket. And it does much better across many of these games. And in some of them, like Berserk, in the bottom middle, you can even get you know, significantly improved performance as a result of kind of training these sparse networks. But RL has kind of always been observed to be far more variable than image classification. That's one of the reasons it's harder. So we don't see this effect for all games. In fact, some of the games, there is no effect at all. Um, so when you try this on curl, it turns out that you know, winning tickets don't help you, at least using this particular reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, so just to finish up, Kind of the key takeaways that I'd like you to remember from this is that winning ticket initializations actually do contain these generic inductive biases. Um, and that can be used to make these things practical, practical, almost practically useful immediately, right? We can take winning tickets in the context of one data set and then just give me any new problem. And so long as it's similar enough to the problem that I got the data set, the original winning ticket from, it'll probably still work. Maybe not quite as well as if I had generated the winning ticket from scratch, but close to as well. Um, and two, this phenomenon isn't just kind of an artifact, but actually says something deeper about how deep learning works more broadly. And with that, I'll be happy to take any of your questions.